Rome rules undisputed from the desert sands of Mesopotamia to the highlands of Caledonia. The empire rests on the strong shoulders of legionaries who keep barbarian hordes in check and push the borders further. The entry into the Roman army. It is the year 100 AD in the early years of Emperor Marcus Trajanus's reign. Rome's empire has no end, but Rome's safety is threatened everywhere. Against these many dangers stand two great defenses, the wisdom and energy of our emperor and the power of the Roman army that always faithfully protects and serves the Roman people. Now is the best time ever to join the Roman army. Three generations after Emperor Augustus made it a career army, the Roman military machine has been perfected into the deadliest, most sophisticated fighting force the world has ever seen. Everything is organized with Roman thoroughness, from the moment a recruit is enlisted until after their retirement or a decent burial. A legionary can find their new home in a military base anywhere in the empire where they live and train to be in top shape when the army goes to the field. For the right kind of recruit, the army offers guidance, chances to move up, and regular income for the next 20 to 25 years. Who can join? For everyone thinking about spending the next two decades under Rome's eagles, here is an overview of what is expected from them. Roman citizenship. In very desperate times, slaves and foreigners were also recruited for the legions. Today, times are different. A slave who tries to join the army will be sent to the mines for his rudeness or even executed. Nowadays, Roman soldiers cannot be married. However, there is nothing that stops someone unhappily married from fleeing to the legion. Complete and healthy body. The Roman army prefers to recruit people from jobs like butcher, blacksmith or harvest worker who want to mow down something worse. Considering the job risks of such activities, the fingers on every hand of the applicant are carefully counted. The Letter of Recommendation Legion service is now a privilege. How well or poorly a soldier's career starts depends, like many things in Roman life, on personal relationships. Who recommends a recruit and for what reason is crucial for the recruit's future career? When there are plenty of recruits, those with the best recommendations get the best jobs. Once the aspiring recruit has his letter of recommendation and the first weapon he needs for his military career, the next step is to present himself for a probatio interview. The purpose is to make sure that the man is who he says he is, and that he also has a body that can handle the demands that will be placed on him in the coming months and years. If the officer in charge of the test can't find any mistakes in his aspiring recruit, he lines them up for their soldier oath. Until that moment when he has sworn his oath, the potential recruit is a civilian, and he is free to use his reason to run away from the barracks like a panicked rabbit without any further consequences. After the oath, he is a soldier of Caesar, and running away means desertion, plus a terrible punishment that follows. After the oath, the identity of the legionaries is carefully recorded. That means their names are registered along with all birthmarks, scars, or special marks that help recognize them as deserters in civilian disguise, or pull them out of the piles of bodies on a battlefield. Maybe a small group of soldiers is already waiting to lead them to their new home, or the men get the necessary instructions to go on their own. The Legion quarters can be quite far from the recruitment place, so the recruits get travel money to cover their costs on the way. Individuals or groups that are too small to deserve an escort can choose to travel first class and arrive broke, or sleep in uncomfortable places and arrive with a nice little starting money. As you will see, there are many cases where you can either choose to buy relative comfort or grit your teeth and work for your pension. The Roman Army 
When you think that Rome has already been around for about 700 years, you might be shocked to realize that the state has only had a professional army for less than one-fifth of that time. Before, if you wanted to find a Roman soldier, you just had to stop any healthy Roman man on the street. It was very likely that this man had spent the last few months in the field with his general, who was also a Roman consul, when the campaign season ended. Back then, being a soldier was much easier because Rome's enemies lived nearby. For example, when Rome fought against the Etruscans, a few officers could quickly go home for the evening. When the citizens gathered to vote on who should lead them, they did it in Rome, on the battlefield. As a rule, each vote had about the same weight as the voters' military equipment. First, the knights voted. Horses are heavy, so the votes of the knights were very important. Next came the first-class voters, who could afford heavy armor, swords, and shields. A consequence of this voting method was that most important matters were usually decided before the lower classes, who went into battle with slings and sharp sticks. And when you asked the knights and the first class, it was not bad. The conservative system of the Republic was destroyed around 100 BC by the leader Marius, who urgently needed soldiers. Marius got rid of the property requirement and made the state provide the equipment. His changes fixed problems for a short time, but caused big trouble for the future. Once the state started to equip the soldiers, they no longer recruited legionaries only from the countryside, but also from the poor in the city. The problem came when the soldiers, after about 20 years of training year after year, were too old to fight and understandably expected a pension from the state. Politicians quickly realized how smart it was not to anger large numbers of unemployed people who had a lot of experience in fighting. The political crisis reached its peak when the armies of Pompey fought against Caesars and then Augustus fought against Marcus Antonius. It is estimated that in these 18 years of internal conflicts, almost half a million men were called to arms. In the end, Octavian was the last one standing and inherited one of the largest armies the world had ever seen. Despite all the advantages of a super-large army, there was one big problem. The Roman state could not afford them. Octavian had to quickly reduce the army and dismiss about 100,000 men in a way that they had no complaints about being let go. From 60 legions with soldiers, Rome went down to 28, which cost Rome hundreds of millions of sesterces in the short term, but saved a lot of money in the long run. It was also Augustus who set the service time to 20 years, which in practice became about 25 years, and he forbade soldiers from getting married during this time. Augustus also made sure that a soldier who was dismissed could look forward to a payment worth about 14 years' salary. Training and Ranking Training is roughly divided into five different levels, so that just when a recruit thinks he has finished the hardest part, his trainers make it even more difficult. What is a soldier good for anyway? The great general Scipio Africanus once asked, if he can't even run. The army took these comments seriously, and one of the first things a recruit learns is the area around his camp. He runs through it again and again. When a group of recruits can run 20 Roman miles, which is 30 kilometers in five hours, it's time to test them with 40 miles in 12 hours. Once they can do that and still be able to move the next day, it's time to start with the 20 miles again, but this time in full armor. Marching is a big part of being a legionary. It is mainly about being in good shape and fighting well. Once he manages to get to a fight, no matter how far away it is, the legionary is taught what to do when he gets there. Training with weapons is mostly the same as for gladiators. That's why for the legionary, like for a gladiator, the first opponent he sees in training is a big wooden pole where he practices sword fighting. The training is done with wooden swords and shields. Usually, both parts are much heavier than normal equipment. 
but this has made the legionary's arms stronger as he hits the pole hour after hour to practice thrusts and strikes. When he has good skill with the sword and a wooden pole is no longer a tough opponent, it's time to train with the spear. Training with the pilum, a spear, has two parts, how to throw it and how to face it. The opponent is usually another recruit, but sometimes a grinning veteran. And sometimes they like to show every weakness of the inexperienced fighter and make it as painful as possible. Being quick is very important for soldiers, which makes them climb ladders in full armor. As their agility increases, the requirements get harder until the recruit ends up jumping on the horse with a drawn sword. After becoming a somewhat capable individual soldier, it is now time to develop into a somewhat capable part of a unit. One drill follows another, first on the training ground and later in open areas, until the soldiers of the unit move like one organism when they hear a command or a trumpet blast. The unit learns to do everything while moving quickly forward, backward or sideways through uneven ground. After a particularly hard day, it might feel like the whole purpose of the training is to fill them with humiliation and exhaustion, or just to satisfy the sadistic tendencies of a certain trainer, and honestly, maybe he is. But this training is about more than just combining fitness with learning fighting techniques. This tough training makes them feel like a perfect part of a highly mobile killing machine. Plus, they know that the part-time warriors on the other side have only a fraction of the training, discipline and movement skills of a legionary. And even better, the enemy knows that too. The term ranking is a bit misleading. The Roman army doesn't offer its legionaries a real career ladder. Most of those who become soldiers leave after up to 25 years with the same status. That doesn't mean all legionaries are the same. Some are higher than others, and every ambitious legionary works hard to stand out from the big crowd. A recruit can expect to start as a munifex. A munifex is a soldier with no rank or privileges. He is not even on the lowest step of the career ladder in the legion. He is what the ladder stands on. If you are a munifex, the donkey that carries your tent is probably higher ranked than you. Once you are recruited and fully trained, the first goal is to become an immuni. The legionaries split into two categories, those with special tasks, the immunes, and those without. The non-specialists are the woodcutters and water carriers who do thankless tasks like latrine duty and lifting heavy loads. Those who are immune to such work have their own special tasks, whether they work in the forge or do bookkeeping for the legion. Being able to read and write is a huge advantage because the Legion always needs clerks for letters and records. An advantage of working in the office is that it is mostly done indoors. Admittedly, it serves to protect the writing materials as much as the people, but the office worker still benefits from it. If you can't do anything else except be a good soldier, you should aim to become a principales. That is even better than being an immuni, but accordingly, fewer Legionaries have this option. An example of a principales is the optio, a man who is supposed to take over the tasks of the centurion if the centurion is unavailable because he is busy with other duties or has a spear in his chest. A legionary has limited contact with the high-ranking officers of his legion. A good basic rule is to stay away from anyone with a helmet crest running sideways or a nice band under the hinted muscles on their breastplate. The bands are the sign of officers, and the best I can say about these people is that they fight and die at the same pace as ordinary soldiers. Officers are also expected to show great bravery, and because their typical helmets make them good targets, the enemies kill them in large numbers, a fact that causes little worry among most legionaries. In the field, the Roman army doesn't go to war easily. When they do, they usually take the lead. That's why a legionary usually knows a campaign is coming a long time before it starts. First, they take time to write letters to their loved ones and say sweet goodbyes. 
They won't be gone right away, but soon they will have little free time or energy left. Second, and most importantly, they eat a lot like bears before winter. Having a good appetite is good for two reasons. They will enter a phase where they use more calories. Also, it's the safest way to bring supplies to the field by carrying extra fat and supplies on their hips. Whether you believe it or not, you can be both fat and fit at the same time. And a legionary should try to be both before the army sets out. They prepare for the regions and officers to increase the normal training a lot. A smart general knows that especially for a group that has been in a fixed camp for a long time, it's a good idea to spend a week or two outside so everything can get ready before serious marching starts. Sometimes this preparation phase is so tough that the actual campaign that follows feels like a vacation. Everyone still remembers the drills when Corbolo, the sleepy Roman army, turned into a fighting machine of tough killers with great force. The training marches in the winter of the Armenian highlands were so brutal that some guards froze to death on duty. Fourth, they practice digging for victory. Roman generals are sure that the best way to win a war is through digging. If the legionaries are not digging trenches around the marching camp, ten feet deep, they start other exercises like building protective walls, making positions for siege machines, or doing some engineering work on the roads and bridges that the army needs to get where it has to go. Roman campaigns are basically politically motivated fights with high intensity. This means that in war, the Roman army doesn't try to take important strategic points or use blockades and sanctions to hurt the enemy's economic resources. Instead, the generals decide where the enemy will probably fight to defend those goals. At some point, the enemy army will get in their way and try their best to stop the Roman army. The legionaries will make the enemy army surrender in a bloody battle or the enemy's capital will fall after a short, deadly siege. This tiring strategy has worked well for the last 500 years. Now the legions form a marching column and go to war. Usually, the marching column changes its formation a lot once the legion is operating beyond the Roman border or when they march towards an enemy that has entered their area. The choice of formation depends on the type of enemy they are moving against. In rough terrain where there is only one way, a Roman army spreads out over long distances. In extreme conditions, a large army can have 15 kilometers between the front blocks and the rear. Since the troops march at least 30 kilometers a day, it means the front of the army is already halfway to their night camp, while the rear has left the last camp. A Roman marching camp feels very familiar. It looks like the fixed camp the legionary left. Usually, even the tents are set up in the same way as the barracks blocks. The improvised tavern where their comrades quietly stayed at the spots on the Via de Cumana still exists. Even the guards at Tower 12 still rattle their armor to signal other posts when the guard officer arrives on his patrol. They first have to build the camp before the legionaries can settle in the home area. The new campsite is carefully chosen before with flat land, access to drinking water, and the ability to shape the ground. When the legion arrives at the new campsite, the work has already started. Everyone in their unit knows what to do, so some go to find the tents, and others go to the camping area where they have to build their wall and palisade. Usually, it takes three hours to build a camp. Their home is now a tent usually made of oiled leather and holds about eight men. With eight, it gets tight, which means the equipment is usually stacked in front of the tent. On top, as an emergency roof, are the shields in their leather covers. Anyone entering the camp can often see at a glance how wet the ground is. The wetter it gets, the lower the tents are and the steeper their walls. This is because the soldiers push the side walls inward to get a ground cover that makes sure they don't have to sleep with their heads in the wet ground. 
The smaller the tent, the smaller the inside space, and the better the heat from eight bodies can warm it up on a cool spring or autumn campaign. By now, no one is surprised that a centurion's tent is bigger and better equipped than a regular legionary's tent. Field provisions. A big difference between a marching army and a fixed garrison is the lack of cooking facilities. While the army itself might be unbeatable, their supply lines are not, and no army can perform at its best if the soldiers are hungry. That's why a legionary carries enough food for up to seven days. This does not include the tough hardtack that remains after the legionary has tried all other food options. The commanding general makes sure that before the first legionary steps foot beyond the province border into enemy land, large reserves of grain and meat have been gathered to feed them until they reach their destination. The grain is ground by hand. It can be wrapped in coarse flatbread or stirred into sticky porridge. A lazy group, or one that, figuratively speaking, might simply cook the grain and leave it at that. A meal like this quickly becomes boring. To march and dig most of the day definitely makes them hungry. That's why a travelling meal with fresh beef, pork or mutton, or a bit of vegetables on the plate, is very welcome. This food comes from the land the army is currently moving through. Scout teams find out where the villagers have hidden their herds and drive them to the camp to provide the soldiers with fresh meat. Other commands move along the marching route, loot gardens and fields, and return with fresh fruits and vegetables. How to Conquer Cities Finally, the legion stops in front of the walls of the enemy's capital or another important settlement on the way there. Legionaries have mixed feelings during sieges. On one hand, attacking a big city feels like a great reward for a legionary's savings. On the other hand, the risks are so high that having savings might have been unnecessary in the end. A siege is rarely a time to do nothing, where soldiers pay off old debts and polish their dice games while waiting to see if the enemy starves. Generals selfishly want to take cities without damaging them, because then the cities can immediately start contributing to the Roman state's income without needing to rebuild and resettle them. It's important that while negotiations are ongoing, the city residents see the alternative to surrender happening right before their eyes. While the general is promoting peace, his region is busy and visibly building up their war weapons. The first stages of a siege provide a break from the usual legionary routine of running long distances and carrying heavy loads. Instead, the soldiers now run short distances and carry very heavy loads. In a siege, courage comes first, followed by the engineers and building teams. During this time, the average legionary does not swing a sword but uses a pickaxe and drags two baskets full of earth and large pieces of wood instead of carrying a shield. The wood is needed for siege towers, building heavy artillery, and not just for setting up the usual camp, but for a chain of camps around the city. They also build walls, breastworks, and trenches. If the city anticipates reinforcements, a second trench line is constructed to block them. Siege works are built incredibly fast. Several thousand trained builders working in shifts can create a seven-kilometer wall in less than a week. Often, just seeing these preparations causes the city to surrender quickly. Some generals give the citizens of the besieged city the chance to surrender before the first battering ram touches the walls. After that, it's fight to the death, meaning until the other side is dead. When Zula conquered Athens, after a long, fierce siege in the 80s BC, blood flowed so much through the streets that it looked like a small stream flowing from the city gates. If psychological warfare fails, the artillery becomes active. Each legion has a selection of ballistae and catapults. Some are basically oversized bows, while others are designed to throw stones of different sizes, from small like plums to as big as melons, or even bigger. Since they appeared on the battlefield, the artillerymen have prepared their ammunition and carefully sorted piles of round stones by size and weight, waiting between the straight rows of catapults. 
The siege artillery has the general purpose of demoralizing the enemy and the specific goal of driving the enemy away from the walls before an attack. For the artillery to be effective, it must stand closer than 200 meters to the walls it is attacking. What artillerymen fear the most is a malfunction. At some point, the defenders might get too angry and charge out of the gates armed with pots of burning pitch and the literally burning desire to attack their tormentors. Such attacks can come very suddenly. Even a small lapse in the besiegers' vigilance can turn their clever technology into burning wood. Of course, the defenders also try to strike back from behind their walls. The slingers, who are quite vulnerable on the battlefield, have their fixed place during sieges. Their egg-shaped sling bullets even cause heavy damage to men in armor. And when they hit flesh, it closes over the lead, making it a horrible procedure to remove. The defenders know this well, and sometimes their ammunition has obscene inscriptions describing which body part of their target it should end up in. Fire arrows, arrows with pitch, burning cloth pieces right behind the tip, are shot from the walls to set as much siege material as possible on fire. And although they are aimed at machines, such an arrow can also ruin anyone it hits for the day. An even uglier war might be happening underground. If you are assigned to the minor command, the other sides of siege warfare look comparatively fun. The task is to dig a tunnel under the enemy's walls. Once the tunnel diggers arrive there, they remove the foundations of the walls and replace them with wooden beams. Finally, the miners set fire to the beams on which the wall rests and retreat while the main part of the army moves forward above them. If everything goes well, the wall collapses full of defenders just before the attackers meet and storm over the rubble. If something goes wrong with the tunnel digging, the enemy discovers what is happening. The attacking pioneers work in their dark, narrow tunnel, not only with the constant risk of a collapse or suffocation, but also with the prospect of facing armed defenders underground. Some well-prepared defenders do not enter the tunnels personally. Instead, they might send a furious bear and one or two wasp nests ahead. Alternatively, they can fill the tunnel with thick smoke, causing the pioneers to suffocate and flee. Legionaries against the walls. No matter how big the siege army is, eventually the numbers are such that the first legionary on the wall faces the entire defense force. This legionary automatically gets a medal, but if his friends are not very quick, it will be awarded after his death. Every legionary knows that a very stubborn enemy or a very impatient general might make the whole region try to climb the walls. They just have to think for a moment to realize how dangerous it is to climb a battering ram where angry defenders are waiting at the top. That's why most legionaries prefer not to think about it at all. A ladder that is two meters too short doesn't work, but a ladder that is too long can be even worse. The ideal ladder should stop almost exactly one foot below the top of the enemy wall. Only a little longer, and a defender can quickly push the ladder down, and a dozen legionaries will fall to the ground. When the chances are already so bad, it's lucky that the attackers can often count on support from siege towers. These big towers are sometimes six stories high. They are like armored apartment buildings that are rolled up to the enemy walls. The people on the upper floors are rows of artillery, archers, and slingers. Their job is to make sure that no one on the walls is still alive when the legionaries on the ground push the siege tower to the walls and climb the steps. The soldiers' self-control understandably usually gets worse when they finally take the city. Horrible scenes happen when plundering a city, but a smart general lets the siege machines run for hours or even days until he puts his troops back on track. Not least because it's likely that no one listens to him if he tries it earlier. The battle. Finally, after months or years of training, the moment comes to do what the Legion does best, face the enemy in an open battle and defeat them. These are the most important moments in a Legionary's life. 
not only because if things go badly, these will also be their last moments. Fighting in a big battle is something they will tell their grandchildren about. When the name of a battlefield is mentioned, the legionary listens and thinks, Oh, I remember that battle. I was there. Step 1. Getting ready to fight. Because the Roman army takes spying on the enemy seriously, the general usually already knows where the enemy army is, even if it is 30 kilometers or more away. Extra patrols are sent out to explore the land and find a good place to fight the enemy. Once it is clear that the enemy is ready to fight, they find places where the enemy might set up ambushes and also prepare some surprises in the Roman way. In the general's camp, messengers, junior officers and centurions are always coming and going. When the soldiers start their day in the morning, everyone looks at the general's tent, the Praetorian. If they see a red flag, the commander will order the battle today, and the legionaries leave with their clean armor, sharpened swords, and polished helmets through the gates to take their positions. When the enemy lines up on the other side, they take a deep breath and try to keep their breakfast down. The waiting is over, and by dinner time, many people will be dead. While they wait in lines, they listen carefully to the general's speech. If they can understand it well, it's a bad sign. The general speech is an important morale booster. Because only about a legion can understand him at one time, the legion he pays most attention to before the battle are also the ones that need high fighting spirit the most when the fighting starts. From a legionary's point of view, the general should ideally be a distant figure on a horse, only visible above several rows of helmets, and his speech is a few unclear words that reach them thanks to random gusts of wind. But remember to cheer loudly when he is done. The enemy should know that they are confident and have no doubts about the outcome. Legionaries against the walls. No matter how big the siege army is, eventually the numbers are such that the first legionary on the wall faces the entire defense force. This legionary automatically gets a medal. But if his friends are not quick, it will be awarded after his death. Every legionary knows that a very stubborn enemy or a very impatient general might make the whole region literally climb the walls. They just have to think for a moment to realize how dangerous it is to climb a battering ram where angry defenders are waiting at the top. That's why most legionaries prefer not to think about it at all. A ladder that is two meters too short is useless, but a ladder that is too long can be even worse. The ideal ladder should stop almost exactly one foot below the top of the enemy wall. Only a little longer, and a defender can quickly push the ladder down, and about a dozen legionaries will fall to the ground. When the chances are already so bad, it's lucky that the attackers can often count on support from siege towers. These monsters are sometimes six stories high. They are like armored apartment buildings rolled up to the enemy walls. The people on the upper floors are rows of artillery, archers and slingers. Their job is to make sure that no one on the walls is still alive when the legionaries on the ground push the siege tower to the walls and climb the steps. The soldiers' self-control understandably usually gets worse when they finally take the city. Horrible scenes happen when plundering a city. But a smart general lets the siege machines run for hours or even days until he gets his troops back on track. Not least because it's likely that no one listens to him if he tries it earlier. How the Romans plunder. The Romans plunder as methodically as they do with all other tasks. Any survivors of the bloodlust after the attack are gathered and usually sold as slaves. The loot from the city is collected and later fairly distributed. Depending on the situation, the legion might spend another week tearing down the city walls and destroying a few parts of the land. Then the army moves on, not as many, but much richer. Then the army moves on, not as many, but much richer. The battle. Finally, after months or years of training, the moment comes to do what the legion does best. Face the enemy in an open battle and defeat them. 
These are the most important moments in a legionary's life, not only because, if things go badly, these will also be their last moments. Fighting in a big battle is something they will tell their grandchildren about. When the name of a battlefield is mentioned, the legionary listens and thinks, Oh, I remember that battle. I was there. Step 1. Getting ready to fight. Because the Roman army takes spying on the enemy seriously, the general usually already knows where the enemy army is, even if it is 30 kilometers or more away. Extra patrols are sent out to explore the land between the two armies and find a good place to fight the enemy. Once it is clear that the enemy is ready to fight, they find places where the enemy might set up ambushes and also prepare some surprises in the Roman way. In the general's camp, messengers, junior officers and centurions are always coming and going. When the soldiers start their day in the morning, everyone looks at the general's tent, the Praetorian. If they see a red flag, the commander will order the battle today, and the legionaries leave with their clean armor, sharpened swords and polished helmets through the gates to take their positions. When the enemy lines up on the other side, they take a deep breath and try to keep their breakfast down. The waiting is over, and by dinner time many people will be dead. While they wait in lines, they listen carefully to the general's speech. If they can understand it well, it's a bad sign. The general's speech is an important morale booster, because only about one legion can understand him at one time. The legion that he pays the most attention to before the battle also needs the highest fighting spirit the most when the fighting starts. From a legionary's point of view, the general should ideally be a distant figure on a horse, only visible above several rows of helmets, and his speech is a few unclear words that reach them thanks to random gusts of wind. But remember to cheer loudly when he is done. The enemy should know that they are confident and have no doubts about the outcome. Step 2. The start shot, literally. Because Rome has many different enemies and the generals and terrains are varied, there is no typical battle course. Still, it is good practice to start things with a shootout between light troops and some cavalry skirmishes on the wings. At this early stage, those who will later find themselves in the middle of the chaos might get a faint hint when arrows fall from the sky fired by archers about 100 to 150 meters away. Stay low under arrow fire. Under long-range arrow fire, keep your head down. A lowered head can mean the difference between an arrow bouncing off the top of your helmet and one digging into your eye. Also, the well-armed Roman general won't sit still. Roman shields can drive away enemy cavalry soldiers and slingers, and the ugly field guns called scorpions come into action. The long, high-speed bolts are designed to lower the enemy's morale by hitting anyone wearing a particularly nice armor on the three people standing behind them. The sight of this effect strongly guarantees the legionary's heart, even if you can't say the same for his wagon. Step 3. Close Combat you can't say how long the whole prelude will last, but sooner or later the general gives the signal and the cohorts move forward in that slow, thoughtful step that starts an attack into the crowded enemy lines. The spears are thrown. A long hiss runs down the whole line as several hundred swords are drawn from their scabbards and then attack. Because the legion has moved forward in good order so far, the attacking Romans meet the enemy as a solid wall of steel. A special thing about a legionary attack is that the first ones to fall don't even get to fight with swords. They get a big body check from a legionary who has his shoulder behind his shield while the two men run into each other at full speed. If everything goes well, it will knock the enemy out, and a quick hit from someone in the second row of the cohort will finish him off while the line moves forward. Now the enemy formation gets thicker, and it's time to switch mentally to battle drill mode. Push the shield bump into the enemy's face, and while he gives up his cover, stab firmly and diagonally upward with the sword tip into his belly. 
Turn the sword in the wound and pull it out, making the carefully shaped blade make the wound bigger. Over time, the battle line will inevitably get a bit messy, but your job as a trained legionary is to keep an eye on your fellow soldiers to the right and left. Don't fall back so far that you can't cover them, and don't let yourself be tempted to throw yourself forward out of your protection. And remember, when you fight almost shoulder to shoulder with your comrades, wild heavy fighting is dangerous for everyone nearby, not just for the enemy. Only if you somehow get surrounded by the enemy can you start fighting in all directions like a berserker. If the enemy is still stubborn after about five to ten minutes, that means there's a problem. From someone in the front row's perspective, it would now be time for someone else to take the load. A wounded or tired legionary has an option that the men fighting against him don't have. By holding his shield in front of him and then turning his body behind the shield, he can take a step back to the right and let someone from the second row on the left step into his place. After the close combat is over, they chase the fleeing enemies. But first, look around well as a victory nearby doesn't say anything about the situation elsewhere. Step 4. The Aftermath The wounded are lucky that Roman field medicine is impressively advanced. After all, their doctors can rely on 700 years of experience. There isn't necessarily a long line of people needing medical help. The losses in a victorious battle can be surprisingly low because most injuries are taken by the army once it is beaten and the men on the run are stabbed. Most wounds are on the right side where the shield doesn't cover, especially the legs. A heavy sword blow is usually treated by a medic. This man often cleans the wound with wine, vinegar or olive oil, stitches it up and wraps it with linen bandages. The medical tools are regularly sterilized and cleaned after use. Arrow wounds are sent to the medicus, a man with a lot of medical experience at the rank of centurion. He has special tools to remove arrows with barbs and can also sew torn tendons back together. The doctors have a scary arsenal of pliers, probes, scalpels and other tools that even make heroic surgeries on the chest and belly cavity somewhat survivable. Opium juice is a well-known drug that is used effectively. Despite these drugs, such surgeries, which include amputations, are responsible for some of the piercing screams from the dressing station. The infirmaries themselves are usually bright, quiet and clean, and almost certainly the commander personally makes a visit to make sure everything is okay and to praise the wounded for their bravery. In short, the Roman army is one of the better places for wounded heroes. The Reckoning Soon after the battle, the commander meets with his officers and lets the men enter. The general praises those who stood out in the recent massacre. At this point, official honours can also be awarded, especially if the battle has ended the campaign. The highest honours a soldier can receive are wreaths and crowns but usually these are reserved for the high-ranking officers. All in all, the courage of the average legionary is rewarded with neck rings, armbands, and metal plates that are worn on the uniform. Not only do they give the armor a special shine in big parades, but they also raise a soldier's status within the unit. This means that in turn they have much lower chances of having to do latrine duty or other tasks like guarding. What comes next? After a big battle, the legionaries carefully count the fallen enemies and wait to see if the general will let them enter to honor the achievements of those who won the victory. When the emperor is with the army, the tension is even greater. A lot is at stake. Many legionaries have never seen Rome, and the speculations about the legendary city on the Seven Hills are now growing endlessly. Everyone wants to see Rome once. Several strict conditions must be met before a triumph can take place. It is important that the emperor is with the army, because first, no one except the emperor can celebrate a triumph. The emperor himself is allowed, but much more likely he will ask the senate to celebrate a triumph that his generals have won. Second, he is after all the emperor. 
If the victory does not meet the officially high requirements for a triumph, the Emperor has his ways to convince the Senate to overlook these minor issues. For the ordinary soldiers, the most exciting condition of a triumph is the rule that not only the victorious commander must be present in Rome, but also his army. It's a shame not everyone can go, the borders still have to be guarded. There are patrols to conduct and roads to build. So those that the Emperor will take home are first of all those who are approaching the end of their service time or have actually long passed it in many cases, and the injured whose wounds give them the right to full relief. Because the returning army has so many soldiers in their ranks who will soon be retired, the march back to Rome is surrounded by a certain cheerfulness. Although two decades of military service prevent things from going too far, the excitement increases when the army approaches the city and the great aqueducts of water supply are seen swinging down from the Alban Mountains over the plain of Latium. While Rome decorates its temples with a sea of flowers and prepares for a huge party, the emperor calls his troops together one last time and distributes the awards, commendations and shares of the loot. Finally, the legions enter the marching field to move towards the Porta Triumphalis, a city gate that is only for triumphal processions. At the gate, the Senate welcomes the victorious general. This man rides in the triumphal wagon, wears the traditional purple garment of Jupiter, and his face is painted red, an imitation of the oldest statue of this god. To make sure the difference between imitating Jupiter and being Jupiter is clear, a slave stands behind the victor, holds a wreath over his head and says to him, Remember, you are only human. The soldiers march behind him through the streets, proudly wearing their decorated armor and singing triumphal songs. Some of these songs contain dirty remarks about the commander, who lets the not-so-nice jokes go through because it is a very special day. In the Jupiter Temple, in the heart of Rome and its empire, sacrifices are made to thank the god for his support of his people. These sacrifices include the Triumphator's golden wreath and several flawless white bulls. After the ceremonies, the final prayers are spoken, and the legions are led away to become civilians who celebrate for at least a week. The celebrations probably include games in the Colosseum, where some of the captives made during the campaign will find a bloody but spectacular end. How it continues. They can be discharged from the army under one of four categories in the main role of the Legion. The Missio Causaria is for those who have been injured, making them unfit for further military service. A missio causaria is an honourable farewell and comes with limited rights to compensation, depending on the length of service. The missio ignominiosa is not an honourable discharge, quite the opposite. This farewell announces to the whole world that the army sees the discharged person as unfit for any military environment. He is allowed to live again in Rome, but can never take a position in the imperial service. The Missio Onesta is an honourable discharge. This is by far the best way to leave. They have completed their service time to the full satisfaction of their emperor and the army, and they are entitled to full compensation and other privileges as a direct ex-soldier of Caesar. Mortuosist is the alternative method to leave the army. You die. This is a big moment. Finally, after up to a quarter century of regulated existence, where service rolls and trumpet blasts determined every hour of the day, but from now on, the ex-legionary is a free man. He can decide when to get up and what to have for breakfast. That sounds great, until he realizes that freedom also means having to get a bed and find something to eat for breakfast. After others have done such small things for him for another twenty-five years, it is quite a shock to realize that it doesn't just happen by itself. Those who are completely lost in the confusing chaos of civilian life can decide on a drastic escape. They return, go back to the barracks, 
and enlist again. After all, a man who joined the Eagles as a teenager is still good for ten to twenty years of service. Others swallow up a competing institution, which is marriage. It is not uncommon for a legionary to have a woman in the village before the camp, who, with her little helpers, waits for the discharged legionary to come back and make a decent wife out of her. An alternative is to start anew in a new land. If the army has just conquered a new area, how can you keep him calm better than by settling large numbers of discharged legionaries in a newly founded city? From Rome's point of view, both sides can only win. The legionaries can stay in good places they are used to, and in an emergency they can wear their armor instead of their civilian clothes. Of course, the locals will be a bit resentful, but conquered people react like that anyway. Otherwise, you wouldn't need legionaries against them. Ideas for the headstone. Serving in the Roman army is something you can brag about your whole life, but why only for such a short time? The world should know who they were and what they and their brothers in arms achieved. Membership in the Legionary Funeral Society has surely brought enough money for a decent burial and a simple tombstone. But a small extra fee from their heirs can leave an impressive gravestone. After all, they spent twenty years as part of the best war machine ever seen. They were one of the most feared and impressive men in the world. They were a Legionary of Rome. Conclusion the Roman army was a powerful and organized force that played a crucial role in building and protecting the vast Roman Empire. From joining the army, where soldiers went through tough training and earned their ranks, to fighting in intense battles and sieges, legionaries showed great bravery and skill. They were well equipped and trained to handle different challenges, whether it was marching long distances, engaging in close combat, or building defenses during sieges. After battles, the wounded received advanced medical care and soldiers were honoured for their courage and achievements. Those who completed their service had various options, including honourable discharge, starting a new life in Rome or a newly conquered land, or even continuing their military careers if they chose to. The Roman army also ensured that their veterans were respected and remembered, with special ceremonies and tombstones celebrating their contributions. Overall, being a legionary was not just a job, but a significant part of life that left a lasting legacy. The discipline, honor, and strength of the Roman soldiers helped shape history and left an enduring mark on the world.